Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Will Benton. It's an honor to be here at Buzzwords, and I'm really grateful for your time this morning. After Isabel's excellent keynote, I feel like I should point out that I work for Red Hat, but I don't speak for Red Hat. And in particular, I'm not speaking for Red Hat in, these talk, in this talk. These are my own opinions. Uh, the subtitle of this talk, we have a colon in the title of this talk, the subtitle is Repairing the Broken Promises of Ubiquitous Machine Learning. I suspect maybe a couple of you have been to a talk or two where someone says, hey, we're sort of not getting what we expected out of machine learning. Is that fair? Heard that once or twice. Um, so this is, this is also such a talk, right? But I'm, I've been to enough talks that have started with that premise that I hope I can offer you something new. Um, as a bonus, since this talk is scheduled at the beginning of the day, I'll be recommending some other talks you should go to today that are related to themes of this talk. I feel like I owe it to all of you, though, to explain the title of the talk that comes before the colon, though, so I'll do that first. Uh, quick show of hands, who here has heard of Taylor Swift? Okay, so, so a couple of you. Um, just to level set, Taylor Swift is a relatively popular American pop star. It's always difficult to distill an artist's over us succinctly, but from 10,000 meters, Ms. Swift deals with three themes. The thrill of new love, the heartbreak of lost love, and unending rage for those who've wronged her. A song that's in the latter category is called Bad Blood, which deals in fairly general terms with an unnamed antagonist who has wronged Ms. Swift at some point in the past. You might wonder what a hit single from four years ago has to do with the title of this talk or with machine learning, but we're getting there. Shortly after Bad Blood was released, I was at a truly excellent machine learning conference. The details don't matter, but as I was waiting for the keynotes to start, I was looking at a slideshow of sponsor logos. And Bad Blood was playing in the background. The chorus includes these lines, baby, now we've got bad blood, you know, it used to be mad love, but now we've got problems and I don't think we can solve them. I was paying a lot of attention to the news that summer, and it occurred to me that two of the biggest sponsors were mutually engaged in a really acrimonious lawsuit. And one of the sponsors had recently rebuffed an acquisition offer from another, and while every individual I knew at any of these companies was a friendly person, technically excellent, the public faces of their employers were all seriously at odds. Identifying inappropriate background music is a minor hobby of mine, which makes wedding receptions disastrous. Uh, as Ms. Swift got to the bridge, in which she points out that the relief her antagonist has offered is grossly insufficient, band-aids don't fix bullet holes, I reflected on whether or not this was inappropriate background music or actually just a perfect ironic commentary on the collection of technology industry frenemies that were on the big screen behind the stage. I was amused enough to write this down in my notes to put in my trip report, but the conference was starting, so I stopped thinking about it. The first keynote presenter opened by asking who in the audience was disappointed with how their machine learning initiatives were working out. I was fairly close to the front of the room, but almost everyone I could see raised their hands. He acknowledged this response and immediately launched into an imp extremely impressive and polished demo. I'm fictionalizing the details because the details aren't important, but it was one of these things where you have a bunch of vector embeddings of a bunch of wildly different domains, and you combine them to make apparent magic in a way that doesn't totally make a lot of sense. Like, we're going to have separate embeddings for clothing and books and pastries, and we have a way to combine them so that if you tell me what your favorite t-shirt is and the name of the last book you read, I can recommend a donut to you. The actual application was sort of dubious, but the results were impressive, and the really amazing part was that they had library to support to serve these kinds of queries in a very small amount of code. And so you see the presenter concluded, we're actually going to be able to get value out of machine learning after all. And it hit me at that point. Being able to easily deploy a bunch of predefined models is actually not what's keeping me from getting value from machine learning. It was sort of a minor detail that seemed to be addressing the wrong problem. I again thought of Ms. Swift. What if the real commentary of bad blood for that morning was not about the technology companies that appeared to hate each other, even though all of their employees were friendly and excellent people, but about how we're not really addressing the deep problems of using machine learning to create business value and we're solving the wrong things. So in the rest of the talk, I want to look at why machine learning systems are hard and see how we're using the wrong tools, how we've created and are responding to the wrong incentives, and how we're not really solving the deep problems we should. So practitioners know that there's more to machine learning than just training a model and launching it into production. There's an entire workflow that practitioners follow in order to solve real problems. And the end result isn't just a model or a way to train a model, it's a whole pipeline. We start by formalizing the problem we're trying to solve. 
We collect, label, clean, and structure our data before evaluating different approaches to make sense of it. We ensure that our results are defensible, that we haven't overfit our training set. And we're going to deploy that model into production as part of an application and monitor its performance over time. Now, a careful practitioner could find a problem at any one of these steps and realize that he or she had to go back and revisit a decision made in an earlier step. That's why this workflow diagram has these arrows going back, because sometimes these are things we need to fix. Some parts of this workflow directly inform or even provide the code that we're going to deploy into a production system, right? Like our feature engineering step is going to sort of directly inform a feature extraction stage in a production pipeline. Our model training and tuning approach is going to represent another stage in a production pipeline, and so on. Some of these components can, we can turn more or less directly into code, and we can incorporate these stages into a pipeline that takes raw training data, extracts features, trains a model, and then ultimately we put that model into production. We can reuse some components of this pipeline for scoring, like the data transformation and feature extraction routines, for example, as well as the model we trained in the training part with the ultimate goal of putting that model into production, extracting feature vectors from more or less raw data, making predictions, tracking metrics about our predictions so we have an idea when we're going wrong, and archiving the data we saw and the predictions we made so we can explain ourselves when regulators or stakeholders want to know why we did what we did in the future. However, we put these pipelines into production as parts of larger software systems that use machine learning to solve real business problems, and these systems are even more complex than the pipelines, right? If you're trying to identify which products to recommend to when customers are about to check out in an e-commerce site at massive scale, if you're trying to decide whether or not to make a securities trade in a very tiny window with someone else's money, if you're trying to decide whether or not to decline an electronic payments transaction because it's fraudulent, you have a complex system. And machine learning is a part of that system, but it's a small part, and it's a part that can make every other part more difficult. If this diagram looks familiar, it's because I'm borrowing it from a great paper. Hidden Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems, which, like Taylor Swift's Bad Blood, was released in 2015, starts with the premise that machine learning techniques are easy to develop, but machine learning systems are hard to maintain because they have many moving parts, all of which are sort of listed in boxes on this size slide, and their sort of relative sizes are supposed to indicate maybe how important they are. That tiny box in the middle is actually the machine learning code. All of the other things ultimately represent more engineering effort. But the interesting thing about the machine learning code in the middle is that it can make accidental dependencies or other bad engineering properties of these systems more important in ways that are hard to discover. For example, your feature extraction routines are probably uncomfortably tightly coupled to your data ingestion pipeline. If the way you structure your raw data changes, your code might break. But the more important question is, will you notice? Practitioners are familiar with the phenomenon of data drift, where the distribution of data that we observe in production materially diverges from the distribution of data that we trained on. So the model that's performing reasonably well at one point might start performing adequately and then poorly a little while later. The Hidden Technical Debt paper points out that data drift is actually a special case of a general phenomenon of entanglement in machine learning systems. If we add a feature or remove a feature, we've potentially created a change that impacts the whole system. Similarly, if we change anything about the way we've trained the model, like hyperparameter settings or even a random seed, we could potentially perturb some other component that was accidentally depending on a detail we didn't think was important about how we were behaving. Another problem the hidden technical debt paper identifies is the problem of glue code. Many times, these pipeline components are developed by teams other than the teams who ultimately put them into production. And thus, they're treated as black boxes. These boxes need to be integrated together with so-called glue code that orchestrates these stages, manipulates the output of one stage so that it's an appropriate input for the next stage, and so on. So we know that the sort of actual machine learning parts of this, the feature extraction and the model training, require skill, insight, and care. But it's really easy to overlook how difficult it can be to write and maintain robust glue code. I even did it in this slide, right? There's a lot of complexity hidden in those arrows. As we develop more and more complicated pipelines, maybe we have a bunch of branching experimental paths and rarely exercised branches. Not only do we have more of this difficult and brittle glue code, but we also have a much more difficult system to test. I mean, if you think about just writing a regular program, if you have a function that gets beyond a certain length and has a lot of control flow in it, right? It's difficult to read, 
it's nearly impossible to reason about, and almost everyone has had the experience of sort of looking at a program, scratching your head, making a cup of coffee, going for a walk, and coming back, and still trying to figure out how you got to some impossible state, right? A pipeline in which data can flow down one of exponentially many paths, some of which may only be exercised rarely, in the service of building several complementary models, is prone to many of the same types of challenges, failures, and maintenance headaches. Except that it's not just a bunch of ifs in a single function, it's a bunch of separate programs written in different languages and probably running on different computers. In any case, uh, this paper has been widely read and even more widely cited. If you haven't read it, you should. Um, take a photo of this QR code with your phone and then email the PDF to a device that you can stand actually reading a paper on. Um, I wanted to mention this paper because it's a really concise presentation of some serious problems, but I'm not going to spend a lot more time in this talk discussing this paper, but I wanted to introduce it and spend some time on what I think is a really interesting problem, which is how people have taken the message of this paper and responded to it. I've seen this diagram cited in many contexts, but the most fascinating for me is when someone says, hey, remember that hidden technical debt paper? It argued that these systems are complex and have a lot of subtle dependencies, which is why you need to buy our product or adopt our open source project. Sometimes it would be a point product that addressed one of these responsibilities. Other times it would be a system that addressed several of these responsibilities. But in every case, this frame ignores that one of the key points of the paper, which is that it's not the components themselves necessarily that add the complexity, but the interactions, the couplings, the entanglement between these components. So point solutions are really important, but they don't address many of the problems of machine learning systems. I could have the best model serving infrastructure in the world. For example, I would love to have that and I still not have a solution for continuous data quality monitoring. And point solutions don't address the problem of gluing these components together and making the resulting system more robust. We'll come back to this concrete problem later in the talk. So we've talked about why machine learning is hard, but now I want to talk about what we're doing wrong. I want to start that with the fact that many times we choose the wrong tools first, but let's uh, get some background on a particular class of problems. Classical computer vision tasks depend on building a database of image features, colors, textures, shapes, and so on, and encoding them in a way so that the thing we want to identify is identifiable. So here we have a face with heart eyes emoji. Uh, we want it to be identifiable even if we rotate it up to a certain point or scale it, right? Um, so deep learning turns out to be really great for problems like this, sort of computer vision problems, speech and language processing get really amazing accuracy. I remember taking computer vision in grad school and being shocked at the sort of accuracy you could get a publishable result in computer vision before the deep learning revolution with. The, but the promise of deep learning is that we can, to some extent, elide this feature engineering work that we do in our pipeline, because the network is sort of forced to learn useful features in order to generalize from more or less raw data. So if you get your objective right, the claim goes, the features will sort of fall out of the early layers in the network. Put another way, at a high level, what's going on is that we have a neural network with a bunch of layers, each of which is sort of like a separate model. They're all trained together. And because each layer can convey less information than the previous one, there's this filtering effect. So as a consequence, the earlier layers wind up looking a lot like feature extractors, and the later layers wind up looking a lot like, like a traditional model that uses those features. The last layer is where we get our prediction, which is what kind of thing is this that we're looking at. So deep learning has had enormous successes for vision, speech recognition, and language processing, and people have assumed that these successes would be easy to replicate in other problem domains. But the same properties that make it possible to perform perceptual tasks impressively well with less time spent on feature engineering have really bad software engineering consequences for machine learning systems. Done properly, Manual feature engineering means that we've thrown away irrelevant details and kept the things that generalize well and provide some signal, ideally with some insight about the problem space. A technique that encourages us to provide all available information and let an algorithm sort it out may make it easier to get results quickly, but it makes it much more likely that our system has some accidental dependencies on irrelevant details. I'm going to mention another paper now called Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks, which had a fascinating result. The authors showed that neural networks don't necessarily maintain a smoothness assumption. What this means is that small changes in the input model should result in small changes to the output of the model. In particular, that a small input change shouldn't change how we classify an image. But this doesn't always hold true for neural networks and deep learning. 
Like most widely used classical computer vision techniques, these deep learning models are robust in the face of rotation and scaling. I can't fool you, this is still a face with heart eyes emoji. But one of the very interesting consequences of this paper is that perturbing an image with almost imperceptible noise can cause it to be misclassified. And even more interestingly, it's possible to construct this noise in such a way that gets you misclassified with a particular result. So in this case, we've optimized noise to turn this face with hard eyes emoji into something that gets classified as a stack of pancakes emoji. And I hope no one in the audience sees that on the right as a stack of pancakes. It doesn't look like a stack of pancakes. So I think I'm going to make what I hope is a non-controversial claim, which is that in no other neighborhood of software engineering would we accept a technique that worked with cooperative inputs but failed inexplicably in the case of any attempted subversion. Imagine a network service that worked really well for inputs it expected, but failed catastrophically on others. If you're thinking that this sounds like the setup for any post-mortem analysis of a security bug ever, I basically agree with you. I don't want to present this as an insurmountable obstacle. Trying to work around the brittleness of deep learning networks in the face of adversarial examples, in many cases by constructing and using these examples while training the networks, is a focus for researchers and practitioners in this space. But if you're thinking of rolling up your sleeves and becoming a deep learning researcher to address these limitations so you can get good results on a new problem, you'll want to consider my next point, which is that you probably can't afford to do a lot of innovation in this space. For many large problems, identifying the trade-offs between different hyperparameter settings and architectures is literally the sort of task that governments built supercomputers to solve not long ago. The paper I'm linking here reports hundreds of experiments to evaluate network architectures and hyperparameters for machine translation. You might assume someone had done this already, but they hadn't, and the reason is actually in the abstract, because it took 250,000 hours of GPU time. If you're doing this kind of work in the public cloud, an hour of GPU time is $1 to $3. That quickly turns into real money. <laughs> um, if you're doing this work on your own GPU, great. Take 28, 28 and a half years and divide it by the number of GPUs you have, and you get to, this, get to this number. When I proposed this talk, I'd originally planned to discuss another potential pitfall of deep learning, which is that classical machine learning techniques actually outperform deep neural networks on a range of really interesting problems. But when the program came out, I saw that Sillard would be speaking on gradient boosting, and I said, well, I can just assert that classical machine learning techniques outperform deep neural networks on a range of interesting problems, and refer you to his talk, which is this afternoon in the Palais Atelier, for a more complete argument. But the other thing is really sort of philosophical. By focusing on deep learning, we're focusing on the sort of smallest and easiest part to get right of the whole system, right? We want to move our focus to more of the system. So why do we use the wrong tools? I think part of it is that the wrong incentives have led us to solve, led us to solve the wrong problems. And the first bad incentive is one that applies to us as practitioners. It's a social one, right? As an industry, we tend to overword complexity and the esoteric. It's much cooler to say, I trained this enormous and incomprehensible neural network while heating my house with exhaust from the compute farm than it is to say, hey, I was able to improve our overall business metrics to exceed our goals by employing a linear model. And uh, fitting the parameters takes 12 seconds on my laptop, and we can explain why the model made the decisions it made if stakeholders or regulators ask us to justify ourselves. Uh, part of this incentive structure is totally salutary, right? It's that you know, we're engineers, we're, we're scientists, we want to reward curiosity and innovation. Uh, we're excited about new things. We want to see how they fit into our toolboxes. We want to really understand what the trade-offs are. But we can't privilege novelty and innovation over elegance, especially when a simple solution works just as well or has far more appealing engineering trade-offs. The second set of incentives I want to discuss are the incentives of vendors and even of open source communities. If you remember that diagram from the Hidden Technical Debt paper showing how all these components fit together, and we discussed how focusing on machine learning code, that tiny box in the middle, leads to bad engineering outcomes. Um, I also mentioned earlier in the talk that if we focus on just any single box, we're really solving the wrong problem, right? Um, and a lot of people have repurposed this diagram to say, yes, my single box is actually the place where we should be focusing our efforts. And you notice that the focus depends on who's talking, right? It turns out to be the areas that benefit particular vendors or particular projects. And this has only gotten worse as machine learning has become a hotter and hotter area with more organizations putting an AI spin on their technologies. 
Uh, storage vendors would love it if your machine learning initiatives were successful, but they get paid if you buy more capacity. Right? So their incentives are to increase data gravity, get you tied into an ecosystem, and machine learning is one way to do this. Cloud vendors are happy when your machine learning initiatives succeed, but they get paid when you consume more of their resources. So their incentive is to make it as easy as possible to consume more of their resources. Specialized hardware vendors delighted when your machine learning incentives succeed, but they get paid when a larger swath of the compute industry as a whole looks more like the high-performance computing market. So their incentive is to encourage techniques that require massive computing power. So in the case of storage vendors and other platform vendors in general, they're incentivized to help you build tooling to make and manage increasingly con complicated data processing pipelines to the extent that it makes it more attractive to use a platform or a st storage solution for that data. For technical and strategic reasons, this tooling often tightly couples the pipelines you deploy to the details of a particular storage solution or platform. And this kind of entanglement can lead to maintenance difficulties and make migrating your systems or applications close to impossible. Cloud vendors, almost every cloud vendor is going to offer you tooling for hyperparameter tuning, right? I need to run a bunch of experiments at once. I need to figure out which model is the best. I need to use 250,000 hours of GPU time as simply as possible, right? Um, because if you need to run all these experiments, you'll be leasing more capacity from them. Some cloud vendors are even offering this sort of automatic machine learning tooling, right, where you evaluate a bunch of different models and a bunch of different hyperparameters at once for a particular problem. It's supposed to take the human out of the loop, right? You don't even have to think about what kind of model you need. It's an interesting research problem, but it also makes it really easy to consume a lot more compute resources in the public cloud. Interestingly, cloud vendors have an incentive to make it easier to build complete systems, right? Tooling that provides a solution in this space makes their offering stickier, tightly couples applications to a particular cloud, keeps their customers happy, and keeps them coming back. Um, it's too bad that cloud providers don't also have an incentive to make my bills easier to monitor and understand. Another innovation that's come from cloud vendors and, and also from a lot of startups in this space is the idea of a model marketplace, a way to sort of purchase pre-trained models or access to model services to address particular application concerns. I don't want to train an object recognition model. I want to pull one off the shelf and treat it as a black box. So there's a lot of interesting work in this area too, but we need to take care that if we use these kinds of solutions, we aren't just making it easier to deploy something that will be hard to manage. Right? If we buy a model as a black box that makes implicit assumptions about features, we can't really understand or debug what's going on with it. So specialized hardware vendors have done a lot of research and engineering to make training complex models faster, in many cases orders of magnitude faster, than without special hardware support. And this has led to a tremendous amount of applied research that's dramatically expanded the applicability of, for example, GPUs. Uh, but it's also made our systems more complex to configure, more complex to program, and more expensive, both in terms of hardware cost and in terms of environmental cost. Just so you know, I'm not throwing stones. You might even see someone who works for a system software vendor arguing that Linux containers and container orchestration wind up solving a lot of problems for machine learning systems. Everyone has a perspective, and everyone's perspective is informed to some extent by their incentives, right? Even if they aren't speaking for their employer in official capacity. The title of that talk was Gil Scott Heron, Taylor Swift is a step in a direction. I don't know which one, but it's a step. So this isn't to say that advances that are aligned with vendor incentives aren't valuable. Uh, far from it. Like all of the projects I've mentioned are valuable and they represent awesome engineering effort. I'm just encouraging everyone to really consider for any project what needs it addresses, how the incentives of the organization or community that created it align with the incentives of a practitioner community, and what additional work we'll need to do to each fill out a whole picture. So we have problems, right? But I don't think it's that we can't solve them. I think it's that we're solving the wrong ones. The problem isn't that it takes too much Python code, too many lines of code, to deploy a deep learning model that has bad engineering properties anyway. The problem isn't that we don't have enough canned models to solve interesting problems, but that won't produce defensible results or will lead to a pipeline we can't debug. And the problem isn't necessarily that we don't have a way to consume public cloud capacity as quickly as possible. So we spent some time talking about why machine learning systems are hard to build, and we've diagnosed some places in which the wrong tools are employed by people and organizations to solve the wrong problems. In the last section, I want to discuss the problems we should be solving as a community and look at how we can make these systems easier to maintain, just as easy as they are to build. So 
I don't have a lot of text on my slides in general, but I don't want to read this to you. So I'm going to give everyone a second to read this quotation from uh, Edgar Dijkstra. Got it? OK, so this infamous quote, we see it's almost exactly 44 years old today, and it's both funny and true. It's funny because I hope we assume that the median pure mathematician is a much better mathematician than the median programmer, like, like not even close, right? Um, but I think that's largely because better abstractions, better tools, and better engineering practices have democratized access to programming in a way that we have not democratized access to pure mathematics. There's a wide range of people programming and creating valuable things with computers because it's easier to get started and it's easier to figure out where things have gone wrong so we can fix them. But it's true because programming is still actually really hard. Like, I wrote my first programs when The Clash were still recording good albums, and I still occasionally get confused or stumped. Pache Ms. Swift, I think we actually can solve the problems of machine learning systems to make them more robust and more maintainable, and I think we can take cues from how we've begun to address these problems for software development. Consider how the dominant user interface for programming has changed since Dijkstra wrote that memo from decks of punch cards that ran overnight and returned a printout of either results or errors, to compiled languages in which we could build programs interactively at a terminal, to languages that support immediate interaction, which can be compiled and run phrase by phrase as we type with live feedback for errors. One lesson of better and faster feedback in programming language user interfaces, which is not going to be news to anyone who's taught a programming class before, is that you don't need to be perfect in advance if you can find out right away that something is wrong. By making the dynamic behavior of our machine learning systems easier to observe, we can make it easier to understand, which is an important first step to making it possible to debug when things go wrong. This is a general distributed systems problem, right? And it's actually something that several open source communities are working on, and it turns out that taking advantage of general purpose observability and monitoring functionality turns out to be a really great potential advantage of putting your machine learning systems on Kubernetes. We should also build better abstractions for machine learning systems overall. Another great sort of computer science quote is Alan Perlis saying that a programming language is low level when its programs require attention to the irrelevant. If you think about programming, Think about the spectrum between machine language, assembly language, low-level languages, and high-level languages, just whatever definitions you have for those concepts, right? Now, if you think of our machine learning systems, the last thing you built with machine learning, how many irrelevant or accidental details did you have to think about with the tools you used? Another way we can make things simpler is to really focus on feature engineering and get rid of useless features. You probably have an idea that most of your features aren't containing any information, right? Like if you run PCA on your features, you can probably get rid of 90% of them and your model will perform just as well. But you also ideally have some domain knowledge. Maybe you know that some features are correlated at the source. Maybe you know that some are even causally related. By eliminating some of these before you use them to make any decisions elsewhere in your system, you can make the overall system easier to maintain and debug by ensuring it's less likely to develop accidental dependencies on redundant or low information features. Let's put it another way. Just because a lot of algorithms can deal with high dimensional data doesn't mean they should. By applying domain insight to winnow down the feature set, this also gets to sort of what feature engineering should be, right? Extracting meaningful general patterns from data to use as signals for our model. We can also make things simpler by focusing on simpler models. Instead of using our engineering cleverness to figure out how to use complex intellectual frameworks to solve complex problems, we should be clever in how we make complex problems simple. What's the most straightforward technique that will get us good results? Could a little extra feature engineering enable us to use a simpler model? Instead of optimizing model parameters, what if we identified ways that a basic summary of our data could solve a problem just as well? There are a lot of cases where a clever application of a sketch could solve the kind of problem that we might be inclined to use a model for. With the bonus that the trade-offs and engineering properties of sketches are typically easier to understand than those of conventional machine learning models. For an example application of how to use sketches to solve a machine learning problem, let me refer you to a wonderful talk this afternoon. Sophie Watson will be discussing some real-world concerns in implementing recommender systems, and as part of her talk, she'll show how the MinHash sketch, a probabilistic data structure for identifying set similarity at scale, can support personalized recommendations with much more attractive maintainability properties than conventional techniques based on matrix factorization.
And if none of that makes sense, it's all explained in the talk. To talk about another problem we're solving, let's look at this hypothetical line of code. What kind of thing is x? It's a float. What does it mean? Is it a threshold? I mean, is it a probability? Is it a scaling factor? We don't know, right? And not knowing what kind of thing x is makes it harder to maintain whatever code includes this line. You could argue that maybe we solve this problem by choosing better variable names or commenting our code or any number of other ad hoc ways to sort of have documentation. But these might or may not buy us much in the long run, right? Comments and even variable names get out of date when your code changes. There is one kind of code documentation that's been proven useful over time, though, and that's the type signature. Type signatures are useful because you can automatically check when they get out of date. Now, Will, I hear some of you objecting. The type systems I know about only talk about the shape of the values I'm dealing with. They don't talk about the kinds of things that we're putting into those shapes. Right? We just talk about floats. We don't talk about thresholds. That's a reasonable objection. I hope you won't still have it at lunchtime, because I hope right after this talk ends, you'll head over to the Franz Salon and see Eric Erlinson explain how type systems can encode and check units that you're using in your computations. His talk will focus on how using unit types will make your data engineering work more reliable, but I bet you'll come out of it with some ideas for how to use these types for machine learning as well. Another place where advanced type systems that have made software engineering better could also make machine learning systems better is in encoding contracts about behavior. For a motivating example, consider the noun list. How many Python programmers do we have in here? How many people is something other than Python, anything other than Python, not Python? OK, so the Python library uses the word list to mean a data structure that has essentially constant time access to a bunch of, you can assume, they're contiguous elements. Uh, every other part of the computing industry uses list to mean a linked list, where if you actually want to access something in that linked list, you have to step through one at a time. So if you want to access element five of a list, you have to do five steps. In general, it takes the number of elements in the list. It's proportional to the number of elements in the list to access anything. Right? It's linear in the number of elements in the list. So I've seen this assumption from you know, that list should support constant time access break code in the Scala language in particular, or cause it to dramatically misbehave in production in many contexts. And I've seen this everywhere from like code developed by super smart interns who are Python programmers writing Scala against their will. And I've seen code developed by Scala experts that depends on lists being constant time access, and they really should know better. Um, Substructural type systems are a family of type systems that enable us to reason about the resource usage and complexity of code we write. And applying research in this area to the programming languages that we use for machine learning systems could make them more reliable and robust by alerting us to these problems before we put something into production or publish a benchmark or whatever. Of course, you might not want to experiment with type system research or features that your favorite programming language doesn't directly support. But you can still benefit from types. Even simply talking about the shapes of values you care about buys you something. Uh, for those of you who are Python programmers, I'm sure you have a story about how some value that you didn't expect to be someplace where you didn't expect it to be caused your program to do something unexpected in a way that you can't explain. Right? Um, and sometimes this turns into wasting a week of GPU time or overfitting a model or you know, any number of awful things. By leaning on the type system that our languages provide where we can, we can make our systems more reliable and easier to understand and maintain. So we're at the conclusion. We're in the home stretch. Thanks so much for being here, for sticking through the talk. I'd like to spend a few minutes reviewing what we've discussed so far today. And those of you who are inclined to photograph slides, there will be things you want to photograph in this section. So have your camera handy. First, we reviewed why machine learning systems are easy to develop but can be hard to maintain. And we framed the beginning of our discussion around some of the concepts in this hidden technical debt in machine learning systems paper. We also saw how the way that people in the community have responded to and used this paper is actually sort of interesting in itself. We saw how complicated models, like the deep neural networks trained by deep learning techniques, can be powerful for vision, speech, and language problems, but can have some undesirable engineering properties. They encourage unnecessary feature entanglement. Their predictions can often be subverted by uncooperative input. 
And they're so expensive to train that only the most well-funded organizations can really conduct exhaustive experiments about how to use them in any domain. We considered how the incentives of individuals and organizations aren't always aligned with our incentives as people who want to make applications of machine learning successful. And finally, we looked at just a few highlights of the last few decades of programming and general software engineering and to see if we can take any of those ideas and use them to make our machine learning systems better. One of the things I love the most about buzzwords is that pretty much every slot I want to go to three or four of the four talks. Um, there are always fantastic talks that explain how to make something about data processing better in the real world. And if I called out every talk you should also go to if you care about the things I talked about just now, I'd still be talking for longer than anyone would stay in the room. Um, I did mention three talks, though, that go into greater depth on some of the topics we discussed in this session, and I hope they're all on your calendar. So thanks again. Um, I'm, I'm here. If we have, uh, we have a little time for questions, but here's how you can get in touch with me if you don't want to ask a question now. I answer emails or tweets, and I'll be happy to talk to anyone about any of these things at the conference. Thanks so much again. Okay, thank you, William.